Okay, good morning and welcome to today's oversight hearing on the healthcare savings agreements reached between the city and the Municipal Labor Committee, which represents roughly 100 public sector unions employed by the city. My name is Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the Finance Committee. Today's hearing is being jointly held with the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, chaired by Councilmember I. Denique Miller, who I know has significant experience with the topic at hand. We've been joined today by Council Members uh, Steve Matteo, Council Member Barry Gudenchik, Council Member Francisco Moya, Council Member Adrian Adams, and other Council Members will be joining us, some of whom are across the way at the other hearing happening in the committee room. Today we'll hear from the City's Office of Labor Relations and the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget about two important agreements related to the health care provided to the city's workforce, their dependents and retirees, a group that totals over a half a million people. In May of 2014, the administration and the Municipal Labor Committee announced an agreement creating a process to achieve $3.4 billion in savings on health care costs over a four-year period, fiscal years 2015 through 2018. This first agreement was the subject of much, much useful discussion with the Committees on Finance and Civil Service and Labor, holding two separate oversight hearings during the course of that agreement. Through the Health Care Savings Agreement, the City implemented a number of new programs and initiatives which successfully helped the City and its workforce reach and exceed the target of $3.4 billion in savings. Today, we are interested to discuss the, find, uh, the final standing of the 24 agreement and its final accounting. Additionally, we are here today to look forward at the new three-year health care savings agreement reached between the city and the MLC on June 26, 2018. This new agreement intends to generate savings of $200 million in fiscal 2019 $300 million in fiscal 2020 and $600 million in fiscal 2021 for total cumulative savings of $1.1 billion. There are a number of intricacies to this agreement which I hope to better understand, including exactly how the savings are being measured. I'm also especially interested in the regulation of health care cost and look forward to hearing about premium rate setting and the city's relationship with New York State as well as with Emblem Health in regards to this issue. Before I pass it over to Councilmember Miller, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of our staff here at the Council for their work on this hearing. From the Council's Finance Division, I'd like to thank Senior Counsel Rebecca Chasen and our new Assistant Councils, Noah Brick and Stephanie Ruiz. I'd also like to thank our Chief Economist, Dr. Ray Majewski, Supervising Economist Paul Sturm, and Senior Economist Kendall Stevenson. From my own staff, I'd really like to thank Sebastian McGuire uh, for the work that he's done on this. And, and now I'd like to turn it over to Council, Miller, uh, Council Member Miller, Chair Miller, to make an opening statement. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. And yes, we have been together doing this for a number of years now and, and, and really excited about this hearing that we're doing together this morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Council Member Idenik Miller, and I am the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to thank Chair Drum for holding this very important follow-up oversight hearing uh, to discuss the new health care savings agreement reached between the New York City and Municipal Labor Council. While we're also looking back at prior agreements and receiving the savings that were achieved. Our last hearing on this issue was in February of 16, and I'm eager to hear what, this, what is in store for this particular agreement, this newest agreement. And the committee staff uh, has done a great job in preparing for this hearing today. Healthcare, and more specifically, high quality healthcare is essential for workers. However, we as a city have much to, to do adequately provide, to be able to adequately provide for our city's workforce. I have said this time before, time and time before, but this hearing is much needed, and we as a city currently spend too much on health care, specifically for quality health care that the city receives, and with the way it is in which health, health insurance costs has risen considerably over the past few decades. As of November 2018, financial plans, financial plans which was recently released, expense are estimated to be nearly $6.4 billion for this fiscal year, while 
it will top out at $8 billion for fiscal year 2022. As many of you know, 20, in 2014, Mayor de Blasio administration settled an expired contract with city workers at the cost of $14 billion. In an effort, in efforts to offset this cost, the union leaders and under the MLC and the Office of Labor Relations agreed to work together to generate cumulative health care savings of $3.4 billion over the four, year fiscal, four, four fiscal years from 2015 to 2018. At the same time, $1 billion was transferred from, uh, transferred from the jointly controlled health insurance premium stabilization fund to cover some of the labor costs. Notably, these agreements regarding health care savings allowed significant savings by changing plans which included co-pays, increases, eligibility audits of dependents and diabetic management programs. And fees, radiologies were uh, renegotiated downward. These, plans change, these plan changes allow for more flexibility coverage as well as reduction of cost plans. On June 26 of 2018, Mayor de Blasio announced a second health plan savings agreement with the MLC covering fiscal period 2019 through 2021. This agreement will look to build upon the first savings agreement that took place in 2015 through 2018. The key features of the new agreement will look to generate cumulative savings of $1.1 billion over a three-year period from fiscal year 2019 through 2021. During this hearing, I would like to understand how the second health care savings agreement is being conducted as well as receive updates on specifics of the agreement we'll be touching on, that we'll be touching on. I'm especially looking forward to hearing about the Tripartite Policy Committee, which is being established in advance of these, of these goals of the new agreement. This, group will sp supposedly be studying a number of high level topics about health care insurance system and a place to offer recommendations for reform. Many of the topics listed in the agreement could have major ramifications for the workforce and the city's budget. So I'm curious what information will be made available to the public and how often. I have expressed concerns many times during my time in office regarding the health care that is available to the workforce. I do not believe that it is all, always adequate. I want, to, I want the second agreement to benefit the workers themselves with substantial increases in quality of care. I don't want to see more costs pushed onto the workers, which undoubtedly occurred in previous agreements. I want to ensure that city employees are benefiting from the savings achieved and that those savings come in, come in the future. Most importantly, I would like to ensure that the dedicated work for men and women of the New York City's workforce, retirees and their dependents, receive the benefits that they so richly deserve. Furthermore, I want to make sure that this agreement and its, its sole provider is the most effective and efficient way of achieving these goals. I'd like to thank committee council and my staff for helping to put this together. Uh, I'm excited about this hearing and I look forward to hearing from the administration as we move forward. Thank you. With that, I, um, I'm gonna swear in the uh, admin. And before we do, let me just announce who's here. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. We will now hear from Commissioner of the Office of Labor Relations, Bob Lynn, Deputy Commissioner Claire Levitt, and the first Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Ken Godner. Uh, and uh, we'll do that after this morning. So, Council, would you do that for us, please? Good morning. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. do. Thank you. You may proceed. Morning, just need that mic. If you hit the button and the little I need red it on red, that's yeah. better. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Miller, uh, Council members. Um, 
I want to express appreciation for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I think we've had productive sessions in the past talking about the city's health, um, labor, health agreements, uh, and I look forward to presenting uh, all the material on both how we've done in the prior uh, agreement and how we plan to move forward in our new collective bargaining agreement. Um, you have before you, and I'm, and I'm joined, as you said, by uh, Claire Levitt, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, for Healthcare Cost Management on my left, uh, Ken Godner, First Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and First Deputy um, Commissioner of OLR, Renee Campion on my right. Um, you have in front of you two documents, the presentation um, that I will be referring to to begin with, and then a series of slides that I will use mainly for my testimony to take you through the various salient um, issues, um, and I will take you through them. They are on the screen, but probably that's not terribly uh, visible uh, to you, so each of you have a printed version of the slides, and I'll take care of that. I, I'll take you through that um, once we get through the initial introduction. Uh, this administration and the city's unions embarked on an unprecedented four-year agreement starting in 2014 to achieve $3.4 billion in health care cost savings aimed at bending the cost curve for New York City's health benefit programs. The city and the unions committed to the plan to save at least $400 million in fiscal 2015, $700 million in fiscal 16, a billion in 17, and 1.3 billion in 18, and those 1.3 billion are recurring savings that go forward into the future um, year after year. Um, when we last testified at the City Council in 2016, we reported that we'd achieved the goals of the program of 400 million for FY15 and 700 million for FY16. We also detailed significant changes we'd agreed upon for the upcoming FY17, um, and we said that we expected uh, to reach the targeted billion dollars at that time. Today, we're pleased to be here to report the successful conclusion of the four-year agreement. Uh, as of June 30th, 2018, and we indeed in, uh, did achieve $3.4 in total health care savings uh, for the period of FY15 through 18, um, and that we exceeded in 17, and we exceeded the amounts in 18, and I'll describe that in a couple of minutes um, of what we did and how we're going to use those dollars. In addition, we'll report today on the details of the successful conclusion of negotiations for a new health savings agreement for 2019 to 2021, which was modeled after the 2015 to 18 agreement. Um, and this establishes new mutual labor management goal of achieving another $1.1 billion, as you mentioned, in total savings, uh, $600 million in the third, um, year, and so I might point out so that there's no mistake, this is $600 million on top of the $1.3 billion recurring, so that we didn't diminish in any way uh, the expectation of savings. We continue with the $1.3 billion, and we've increased that by another $600 million to a total of $1.9 billion of health care savings as a result of these two labor uh, agreements, $1.9 billion recurring annually going out of the, uh, the labor agreement. I want to take a moment here to recognize the efforts of all of the MLC unions and their leadership in this regard, especially Harry Nespoli, uh, President of the Sanitation Workers Union and Chairman of the Municipal Labor Committee, known as the MLC, uh, Michael Mulgrew, President of UFT, Henry Garrido, the Executive Director of DC 37, as well as the members of the Labor Management Health Insurance Policy Committee. Their leadership and willingness to work with us to achieve our health care savings goals help transform vision into reality. Um, the work that has been accomplished in the past four years has been collaborative between the city and its unions, and that relationship has carried forward into the newest agreement that we just reached. Uh, let me start, and I will be referring to the slides, but let me briefly remind everyone of the challenges we face in the labor management health care efforts um, in the broader context of the collective bargaining of the de Blasio administration. As you will recall, when the city, uh, when the mayor took, uh, took office in January 2014, every single labor agreement, and there were 144 labor agreements at that time for 337,000 workers, all of those had expired. The de Blasio administration was committed to a respectful, collaborative labor management process, 
and was also committed to reforming health care benefit structure, which, is rem which had remained virtually unchanged in decades. And I say that having been participated in health care savings in the Koch administration. Um, we reached a labor agreement in 1982, uh, and that agreement was largely unchanged between 82 and when we took a look at it again in 2014. Uh, and I believe we successfully accomplished some substantial major innovative changes. Let's see the next slide. So as I mentioned, um, in 2014, um, we had 144 bargaining unit units to bargain with. Contracts were between three and five years expired, and there had been limited uh, negotiations over health care for decades. Um, we, uh, during the course of the next several years, settled with 99.9% of the workforce. Um, we have about 256 workers still not under contract. We still have discussions. There are issues um, that, uh, before the controller, but that 337,410 of the 337,661 are now under extended labor, lengthy labor agreements. Uh, and as I said, what we brought to the bargaining table was a respectful and collaborative process. We listened to issues that were brought to us. We engaged in conversation over those issues, and we've solved numerous labor issues over the last five years. We also achieved an historic agreement, and I want to thank the, the words of the uh, CBC that I read this morning, uh, that I believe that we did indeed uh, create a paradigm shift in our collective bargaining that we brought the issue of escalating health care costs into our collective bargaining, and we engaged in approaches that adjusted those increases, modified those increases, and truly bent the health care curve. And I believe that we uh, were able to free up dollars from the projections of what the health care trend would be that had been left for us. Um, by the prior administration, the Bloomberg administration had predicted that there would be health care changes um, over about over about nine percent per year that had been based on five, ten, and fifteen year analysis of, of costs, um, and we believed that we could do better than that, and we have in fact done better than that. Um, and so, if you take a look at the next slide, We didn't stop bargaining with having round, uh, wound up the uh, negotiations with virtually the entire workforce. Um, we also moved forward, and in the past um, six to nine months, um, we've settled with uh, three unions, DC 37, the UFT, and Local 300. Um, and we have, um, in fact, now rep uh, wound up negotiations with over 59% of the workforce um, and we are going to continue the process until we again reach labor agreements with the rest of the city's workforce. I want to mention, just because it was the source of the last time I appeared before the council, um, we also committed to work on paid parental leave. Um, at the time I spoke to the council in the spring, we had just had an increase, an agreement with the managerial, or had a uh, an approach with the managerial employees. Um, I said back then uh, that if you give us a little bit of time, um, I thought that we would reach settlements with a substantial part of the workforce on paid parental leave and paid family leave. Um, and in fact, um, we now have reached agreement, uh, in, and if you include the managerial uh, coverage of paid parental leave, 64% um, of the workforce now is covered by paid family leave or paid parental leave. Um, and it is our hope to continue the negotiations. Uh, we will continue the negotiations. It's my expectation um, that we will continue um, to uh, increase that number and paid family leave, paid parental leave uh, will become the norm for the, the city's workforce. If you go to the next slide, I'll now focus a bit on the last agreement, uh, the uh, 
well, we call Health Savings Agreement One. And you start by, the, we have said on a number of occasions, we believe we have bent the health care cost curve. Why do we say that? Some people have commented, no, you haven't reduced health care costs. Uh, and I've said, I've never said we were going to reduce health care costs. I said we're going to reduce the increase, the percentage increase. Um, and people quickly forget what were, what was going on at the time we reached the agreement and uh, we, we reached this initial settlement. Uh, and what had happened was we had a financial plan since the time of the fiscal crisis in the 70s. The city has put together financial plans that look four years out into the future. And of course, you have to predict what's going to happen uh, with health care costs in any financial plan. Um, for the prior 15 years, health care costs had gone up at 9% a year. Um, when we created our financial plan in the beginning of this, of this administration in 2014, of course we used that projection for what would be the cost increases. I think any, if we had all of a sudden said we don't think it's going to go at that level, um, all of the monitors would have said, what are you talking about? Um, you've had 15 years of 9% growth. How can you not predict that? So for those who now casually say, why did you use that number, they're rewriting history. Um, we used the number that we inherited. Uh, of a 9% trend factor. Um, and in fact, what we then accomplished with the unions was an agreement that we would not have cost increases of that level. We would bring that cost, those costs down. And as you can see, um, that the actual costs will go along the lower line of that graph. Um, we have saved in excess of the $1.3 billion, and you see at the right, the $1.3 billion in excess of that continues. We have not, as some people have said, lowered our expectations of where we're going forward. We have taken that $1.3 billion, and we are going to enhance that, and the number will grow. The unions, when we came into negotiations, said to us, why do you want any more? in collective bargaining. You've already achieved 3.4 billion. You've already achieved 1.3 recurring. And we said, no, we're not stopping at the 1.3. We need to exceed that. And so what you see now in the current agreement is that we've exceeded that 1.3 and we continue um, to bend the cost of health care. I do want to say, and, and, and Chair Miller, I, I, I agree with you um, in terms of our approach to bargaining. Uh, and. Uh, it has been called by the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement the triple aim framework of how they recommend that you should start, how you should deal with healthcare costs. Uh, the very first thing we want to do is we want to improve patient care. We want to make sure that the employees, the dependents, the retirees have access to high quality programs now and in the future, and that remains a cornerstone of our work. We want to reduce those costs because we believe, as Denise Miller said, uh, the billions and billions that, are, uh, uh, that go to health care costs, um, we don't want those costs to continue escalating. And so we want to figure out what are those things you can reduce and how do you, uh, how do you control um, the escalating costs uh, that every employer in the country uh, and every employer in the country faces costs that not at the level of inflation. If costs are going up at the level of inflation, um, there wouldn't be a health care problem in this country. The problem is that every employer in the country faces double-digit increases in health care costs, high single-digit costs. And the question is how you bend the costs down so it can become closer to expected costs of inflation. That's what the serious approach to health care um, requires. Uh, and so we have uh, continued the trajectory <coughs> of the last agreement. So let's look at the next slide. And you'll see, as has been described, we achieved the $400 million of savings <coughs> in FY15. We achieved the $700 million of savings uh, in FY16. Um, we have exceeded the billion dollars of savings in 2017 by $51 million. And we've exceeded the $1.3 billion um, of savings in 18 by $35 million. That $1.3 billion, along with the extra savings, will continue year after year. We have not turned around and said, let's reduce that. We've said, let's enhance those savings. And that's what I'm going to describe um, in a little while. 
so let me talk about some of the uh, specifics of how we've done exactly the, the concept of, uh, uh, of reducing costs while improving health care. And one of the really, oh, we lost that, one of the truly innovative approaches um, that we uh, adopted was to study data, labor and management together. And so one of the first things we did was we said, how do we compare to various plans on certain very important expensive areas? Emergency room use. How much emergency room use do our plans, do our workers use? How much urgent care do we use? How much specialist work do we do? How much general radiology, radiology done in a doctor's office? How much physical therapy? Um, and how do, how do we compare to two types of plans? well-managed plans, which, in, which include the industry's best practice, um, and loosely managed, which are more conventional, conventional plans. How do we compare? And then there are areas that save costs, preventative procedures, visiting, visits of primary care physicians. Those are all things that are good for a plan, good for employees, good for health care uh, delivery, um, good for population um, uh, improvement of health care, those are all things that are important, and we said we're, we're too low on the preventive end, those the, issue, the, the color, the, the right-hand uh, bars, and we're too high on, those, on the things on the left. What do we do about that? And so I think what is, what is missed in some of the cavalier comments that have been made by this about the labor agreements is we sat down together and we said, here is the data, here are the results, here here's what the problems are, let's adjust our copays in a way that changes behavior and lowers costs, changes behavior to a more effective health plan, to a plan that delivers better results, and lowers costs at the same time, or reduces or modifies increases in costs. And so if you go to the next slide, what did we do? We said labor and management together. We should increase copays. And so yes, there are certain areas where increasing copays I think is beneficial to a plan. If there's over emergency use, uh, emergency room use, we increase the copay from $50 to $150. But at the same time, we said, if you go to preventive care, or if you go to a, uh, a, a primary care physician uh, at certain locations, advantage care physician locations, um, there the copay goes down. So we've used two levers. We've used one lever to increase the cost in order to steer people away from things that are not a productive or effective use uh, of, uh, of health of healthcare uh, delivery service, and others to lower costs, which is a much more effective use. And so we made the changes that you see in that slide. And what was the result? The result was that we lowered emergency room use, we lowered urgent care, we lowered specialty use. We lowered general radiology, we lowered physical therapy, and we increased the use of preventive procedures, and we increased preventive uh, uh, visits. So that we have used the system to indeed, used our process of, of co-pays and the, and the healthcare uh, coverage, we used it to control costs while improving utilization of the type of, uh, of services that are used. And if you look at the slide, you see the before and after. Um, we, did, we were able to achieve exactly the type of outcomes that we were looking to do. In the um, other initiatives that we, and, and this is in my testimony, um, but that we uh, uh, invested in care management, uh, we invested on, uh, uh, on providing in HIP uh, preferred providers under a value-based arrangement where physicians have incentives to provide improved care coordination. That's good for the employees, improved care coordination. Um, we use best doctors to do an expert review for oncology. Um, and we did competitive bidding for the first time uh, on prescription drugs that resulted in substantially lower pricing and we saved $130 million as part of the $3.4 billion. Those were some of the things we did. Um, if you take a look at the next uh, slide, um, we have set up uh, at, uh, at OLR um, and under the expert guidance of uh, Debbie Friedman, who works, who's the head of that uh, operation, 
Um, we look at population health, uh, and we've done some very important things. Um, we have uh, reinstituted uh, on-site influenza vaccines, um, which were eliminated as a cost-saving uh, approach from the prior administration. Um, rather than reducing uh, influenza shots, uh, we believed that increasing the number of influenza shots, making them more available, would ultimately save more money um, in the process uh, in terms of lowering overall health care costs. And so we've increased flu shots by 28%. Um, we have instituted Weight Watchers programs where we have uh, there are now 37,000, uh, we've, we've, we, uh, we have highly discounted rates and over 37,000 employees have used uh, Weight Watchers, 25,000 in this past fiscal year, FY18. Uh, there's a statistic on here, um, a combined weight loss of 105,000 pounds. Um, and uh, that there is 16% of the participants lost 5% or more of their body weight. Uh, that issue of body, uh, of, of uh, control of, um, of eating and, and overweight employees is central in how you deal with diabetes, an incredibly expensive um, cost for the, uh, uh, for the city. And we set up a, a diabetes prevention program um, that was recognized by the uh, Center for Disease Control um, as, uh, as a program that was, was effective. Um, and in that program, 53% um, of the people in that program lost 5% or more of their body weight. 27% uh, lost 7% or more of their body weight. We have programs that are discounted programs that are going to make health, make our employees healthier and are going to reduce health care costs at the same time. Exactly the type of work um, that we would want to do with the triple aim that I talked about uh, initially. And so then we said, that's not enough. These were good programs. We exceeded the amount of the 1.3 billion. Let's exceed the 1.3 billion annually by more. And let me emphasize that point again. The 1.3 billion of savings of the last agreement continue into 19, 20, 21. Those savings continue. We have enhanced those savings by $200 million in 19, $300 million in 20, and $600 million more in 21. So we will actually be at $1.9 billion annual savings from where we started this process when the administration began. So as you see on Table 16, um, you have the graph that shows again the expected rates. And how did we come up with these rates? I heard recently a comment, oh, we, we, over, we overestimated the rates. There's a ridiculous comment that, in fact, we used what actuaries told us was a responsible projection of health care costs of 7%, 6.5, and, and 6. Had the city, when it put together its budget um, in the beginning of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the calendar year, used a lower number, I'm sure all the critics would have said, well, how can you possibly predict rates lower than what the actuaries are predicting? So we used the actuary projections. That's what the actuary predicted would be the cost of our healthy inflation uh, the trend factor on our health care costs. And then when we worked with the unions to come up with new plans, not cutting old plans, additional new plans that would reduce those costs and those, those cost increases and bring them down for a new 600 million or 1.1 billion, as Chair Trump said, um, over the course of the, um, of the agreement. And so you see on page, on uh, table 17, you see the savings that I mentioned. So the new initiatives of the health care agreement, one of the very significant aspects is that we have an agreement from Emblem on the HIP increases for 20 and 21 to be three and a half and three. Not the six and a half and six that we had projected. Anyone who says, well, that just, you know, could have gotten anyway, that's sort of another ridiculous comment, that at a time when health care is going up at high single-digit levels, we have achieved in, 19, in 20 and 21 an increase of three and a half and three for two years. 
of the agreement. How do we do things? How do we get there? Well, we have centers of excellence for oncology and orthopedics. We have site of service redirection, um, where, where you, uh, um, you move uh, things to, into freestanding facilities in doctors' offices rather than, uh, um, than in hospitals for AM surgery, chemotherapy, high-tech radiology. Um, we've increased wellness programs, um, and we've in in that we have now uh, provide for mandatory enrollment of new employees in the first year um, of service. These types of approaches is what let us change the projection of seven, six and a half, and six to the current year and then three and a half and three thereafter. We made changes in GHI um, as well also creating centers of excellence. And exactly, uh, Ch Chair Miller, exactly the point. Centers of excellence are employees are being directed or being in uh, incentivized to use those places that have the best results, the best outcomes. That's what we want our employees to use. Um, we want to use drug formulary and 90-day uh, refills um, in order to, uh, um, to lower costs. Um, we want to create a program um, on uh, fertility programs where utilization management um, can be employed in order not to change results, to so enhance results and to lower um, costs. Um, we want medical management uh, enhancements in our, in our process. So all of that was part of the last, uh, of the current agreement, um, which we feel pretty certainly will get us to the savings um, that we've uh, talked about. And let me point out, just like the last agreement, if we don't achieve those savings, there is enforcement through third-party arbitration. But I think an incredibly additional, important additional agreement was the establishment of the Tripartite Health Savings Committee. So this is not in lieu of the savings. This is in addition um, to, the, uh, um, to those savings. And this is not uh, somehow eliminated because we've reached important settlements with DC 37 and the UFT. This is part of those settlements is that we would agree to the healthcare savings of the, of the new 200, 300, and 600 million, and we've agreed to a committee that is going to look at the following issues. And, and I, I can't tell you these are issues that have been absolutely central and third rail issues in labor negotiations in the city for decades. And we now have a tripartite group um, that is going to, to look at these issues. And I, I want to go down that list of the issues that, uh, that the, the tripartite group, and the first meeting of that tripartite group is this afternoon. Uh, the, some of the issues that we're talking about are RFPs for replacement of CBP and HIP programs, exactly the, kind of the concept uh, that Chair Miller was talking about. We need to look at that. Um, Self-insurance, minimum premiums, Medicare Advantage plans for retirees, um, consolidated drug purchasing, and I'm going to get back to that um, also in a minute. Comparability, how do we compare to other plans? How do we, how do we move to uh, the best possible state-of-the-art 21st century plan? Um, hospital and provider tiering, I know it's an issue that's of, of a concern and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Audits and coordination of benefits. The stabilization fund, which was referred to. Um, the dollars are, are diminishing there, and we need to look at uh, um, what that means. Um, and reduction of costs for pre-Medicare retirees who have access to other coverage, an important issue that the city has been concerned about for years, continues to be concerned about, and we hope to make major progress uh, in this tripartite committee. Let me talk about some of the uh, issues that have been recently in the press. And, uh, uh, the first is hospital uh, pricing variations, which I know was a topic of a uh, council hearing last week. Um, and I want to say that in our, looking at our uh, employees, um, looking at a, uh, uh, a case mix adjusted, so the same type of difficulty uh, and severity of, uh, of uh, procedures, um, that New York Presbyterian costs on average about 35% more than the average of all the other hospitals. And those other hospitals that are in that include teaching institutions. It's not that we're comparing uh, New York Presbyterian to, uh, um, to others that are, uh, um, 
that are much different type of institutions. There are active teaching institutions, large teaching institutions in there. Um, and the costs are 35% uh, um, are higher. This is an issue that we need to talk about. And in fact, um, when we said that we are going to look at, uh, at hospital tiering, uh, in our tripartite group, hospital and provider tiering. It's exactly the sort of issue that we want to look at with, uh, with the, uh, the employees, um, with the labor unions, and we want to see how do we deal with issues like this? What's a fair, responsible approach um, to, uh, um, to an issue like this? Um, another area, consolidated drug purchasing. that we recently uh, had the issue with one of the city welfare funds uh, of that they th thought because of the high cost of hep C uh, medication um, that perhaps they were not going to, uh, to cover those costs in the welfare fund which provides the prescription drug coverage. Um, and we worked out an arrangement um, with the Health and Hospitals Corporation uh, where Starting in 2019, we're going to provide comprehensive medical treatment at H&H &H and low-cost access to, a, uh, to health, hepatitis C medication. We believe that this collaborative approach of working with health and hospitals, using the buying power of health and hospitals, providing the care at health and hospitals, made a tremendous change in the ability to provide hep C coverage uh, at a more reasonable rate. And we think that this really can be a model uh, for other areas, um, including PrEP. Uh, I'm going to talk about that for a minute, because I know that that has been a, uh, also a concern of the Council. Uh, right now, 97% of our workforce has access in their, uh, in their welfare fund coverage um, or in the high option rider um, to uh, PrEP coverage. Some of the plans have uh, more high, highly higher deductibles than others. Uh, the question is how we do two things. How we extend the coverage from 97% to 100% because we know how important this is. Uh, I know how important this is to the mayor I work for. I know how important it is to the administration. I know how important it is to the council. Um, we, in fact, sent a letter to the union welfare funds who are not covering uh, PrEP uh, uh, prescription uh, drugs, um, we sent a letter saying we think you should consider uh, covering this and we think you should work uh, to do that. Uh, I believe that the effort of the city council, of the city council is extraordinarily important um, in helping convince welfare funds um, that they should indeed expand this coverage and perhaps even lower the cost of it. But I also think that we need to look at um, this issue from the same type of model of the Hep C model, uh, and perhaps we can uh, make an approach or come up with an approach that can lower the cost uh, of providing this coverage as well. Um, and it is going to be a topic in our tripartite group this afternoon as to how we move from 97% to 100% and how we make certain that the costs are reasonable. Um, for the city, for the city workers. So let me now close. I think that, uh, I hope you can see that that triple aim uh, for health care is in fact front and center um, in our approach to labor negotiations. Uh, that we want to improve patient care. Um, we are not simply uh, saying let's reduce costs by shifting costs to workers. We're trying to avoid that. We're trying to become more efficient and more effective, and at the same time, we want to improve the, the health care of our employees, our retirees, and our dependents. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And before we just start with the questions, let me announce that we've been joined by Councilmember Keith Powers, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, Majority Leader Kumbo, and uh, Councilmember and Chair of the Finance Committee, the Subcommittee on Capital, uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson as well. Hope I got everybody, yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much, as I said, for your testimony. Uh, let me just start off with uh, this question. According to the November 2018 financial plan, 
the city will spend roughly $6.4 billion on health insurance this year. This figure reaches approximately $8 billion in fiscal 2022. Could you break down to uh, the committees um, the cost for this and what percentage is, act is for active employees and for retirees? So I'm not sure I can do that at this moment. Uh, and I do have uh, Ken Godner, the first uh, deputy budget director, who can talk about that or we can provide information. But let me just uh, express one comment before I turn it over to Ken. Um, it is true uh, that health care costs are very substantial a part of our budget, um, as I think is true for every employer. Um, we do cover almost a million lives uh, between actives uh, and uh, retirees uh, and dependents. Um, so the context of the dollars have to be put in the context of the overall um, number of, of lives that we cover. Um, in fact, we believe that our health care costs on a per capita basis um, are responsible. Um, but that does not stop our constant work on making sure those costs do not increase uh, at, uh, at, any, uh, at, uh, at rates that ordinarily they would increase at, um, and that we need to look at how we become more efficient and more effective. But I believe that the central concern of an employer should not be simply how do we make our costs the employees' costs. Our concern should be how do we bring down overall costs or how do we not increase as much as otherwise would have. That's the central concern. Um, and it sort of becomes a uh, uh, sort of an end in itself. Oh, let's just shift costs to employees. That's not what you want to do. You may shift costs to employees but have a plan that's much more expensive at the same time of shifting costs to employees. And so having shifted costs to employees with a plan that is more expensive hasn't saved anyone anything. The employee is paying more and the employer is paying more. How do we get control over those costs? That's what we've been doing. That's what collective bargaining has been doing. And I'm very proud of changing the paradigm as we've done in this bargaining. Ken? So I don't have the, the breakout for each year, but uh, in FY19, approximately 1.8 billion of the 6.4 is for retirees um, and uh, the 4.6 billion for active. Um, we can provide the council with you know more information uh, after the hearing if you want. Do you have what proportion is exclusively uh, for the city's contribution to uh, the health insurance premiums? I'm, I'm sorry, I think all of it. I, I'm not sure. Is there a total cost for premiums or? That, that's a, that's the total city spend. So that's the total insurance. amount. Right. The, there are, as, as you know, um, a number of uh, plans with l smaller participation where employees pay additional uh, co-premium, but that's not a city expense. It doesn't appear in the budget. So. Okay, in 2014, uh, the 2014 savings agreement stipulated that at the conclusion of the agreement in fiscal 2018, there would be a final calculation of the savings realized. It further stated that in the event that more than $3.4 billion was saved, the first $365 million would be credited proportionately to each union as a one-time lump sum lump sum payment for its members. Additionally, any savings over the $365 million would be split equally between the city and the MLC. In the new agreement, however, the following is stated. The parties agree, and I'm quoting, the parties agree that any savings within the period of fiscal 2015 to 18, over $3.4 billion arising from the last agreement will be counted towards the 2019 goal. This is currently estimated at approximately $131 million, uh, but will not be finalized until the full year fiscal 2018 data is transmitted and analyzed by the city and the MLC's actuaries. So uh, what is the final additional savings from the previous agreement? So if you go back to slide six, table six, you can see that there was a surplus of 51 million in 2017, another 35 million in 2018. 
So that represents the 86 million that I think I mentioned in, the, in my testimony. Um, the agreement with the union, unions and the MLC was that it, the first 365 million, so this is less than 365 million, it's 86 million, um, could be used for a lump sum agreement or otherwise as agreed to by the parties. Um, we in our negotiations um, agreed that this 86 million, which were the additional savings beyond the 3.4 billion, um, could be used um, in the first year, as you mentioned, um, of the next labor agreement. Uh, and so if you take a look at, there's a second. If you take a look at slide 17, you will see that our objective of $200 million in FY19 um, would be partially offset by the 86 million of the additional savings uh, from the last contract. Note that that doesn't impact the next years and the recurring costs, so I'm not reducing the current costs going out, but the 86 million of that same as the lump sum payment that might have been used, that is used to offset the 200 million by the agreement uh, of the parties. Okay, um, at a previous hearing on healthcare savings, you spent some time discussing the health insurance regulatory system in New York State. Um, I understand that not all health plans are created equal, and only some policies are subject to the state's prior approval law. This means that the HIP premium is subject to approval by New York State Department of Financial Services, but not GHI, which is the largest plan by a long shot. Uh, which of the city's policies are subject to the prior approval law and which are not. So is that, uh, I, I know that HIP does go through regulatory procedures, uh, proceedings each year. What's that? Because it's, because it's a fully insured plan. Um, and I think that GHI does not because we pretty much self-insure um, that plan. Um, but the state does, um, re does regulate the GHI costs, I'm sorry, the HIP costs, um, and we regularly respond um, to those, at, in those rate proceedings um, to our comments on the, and our thoughts about the costs for, uh, um, and the projected costs that are uh, being requested. So what's your opinion of the prior approval um, plan access? Um, wh what are your sentiments on that? So I, I do think that, and I'm not sure I'm answering exactly your question, but one of the things we are looking at is whether we should try and find the ability to self-insure um, the HIP plan. Um, there are substantial savings that would come from self-insurance um, and that that would or would not change the regulatory, probably would change the regulatory impact. But we believe that most employers, I think virtually all employers other than us, with employee size as we have in, in the city and, and total number of lives covered, um, should be um, employing self-insurance um, as a way to uh, provide their, uh, uh, their health care because of the savings that that would provide, both in taxes um, and in overall costs uh, of implementing the plan. Um, so those are things we're looking at. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look again at the slide of what we're dealing with in the tripartite committee, slide 20, um, you see that uh, the second bullet um, is self-insurance and minimum premium. That's exactly the, the, the topic in the area that we'll be considering with the unions. Can you explain what you mean by self-insurance for HIP? Which of the two of you want to go? Ken. Um, the, the HIP plan is currently a fully insured product, which means that we pay a premium to the, to the carrier, carrier pays all uh, the claims. Um, and you know, if claims are higher than, than the premiums, that's, that's the, that cost winds, you know, resides with the insurer, and if they're less, those, those funds are kept by the insurer. Uh, moving to uh, you know, minimum premium or self-insured plan means that claims are paid out of a out of an account, right? That's a, a city account, so that the cost of claims um, is entirely a city cost, um, and the insurance company neither takes the risk nor nor reaps the benefit when when this goes the other direction. Um, so there are there are a number of reasons why that's beneficial, uh, like. Commissioner Lynn said uh, there's a tax advantage to doing that, in addition to which, um, presumably, uh, the insurance company builds in 
some cushion so that they don't lose money, that's additional funds that the city's paying to the insurance company. Have premiums for GHI and uh, HIP um, increased uh, at a faster pace than other plans? So I don't think they have. I, mean, I think that uh, they've, they've increased at different rates, um, which is part of uh, um, some of the issues that we've been uh, dealing with in, in the collective bargaining. Um, but that uh, the rate of increase has been, I think, fairly similar to national increases in health care costs. Is that a fair statement? Yes. yes. Can you provide us in the recent In the recent past, in the, during, during, at least during our term, our, our administration. Can you provide us with the annual premiums for the plans going back to 2007? Sure. Okay. Um, Emblem Health has requested a rate increase of 5.8% to the New York State Department of Financial Services for HIP in 2019. However, despite this requested increase, the city included in the budget a projected health insurance cost of 7% in 2019 and 6.5% in 2020. It is unlikely that the state will improve the rate increase that is higher than what Emblem Health is requesting. And in fact, they will likely agree to a rate probably that is lower than the request. Are you anticipating that DFS will approve a rate higher than what was requested? And why would the city project a cost increase of 7% when the requested, requested rate increase is only 5.8%? So first of all, I, I think our understanding is the requested rate increase is 6.97, uh, not 5. So it's slightly, for 2019, for 2019 slightly under the, uh, the 7, but, uh, but, but not much. Um, but remember the order of the process. Um, we create the financial plan well before there's a labor agreement. Um, and well before HIP has provided, uh, has presented its rate request. So you have to, the city has to come up with projections um, of where the rates will go, um, not knowing what the actual rate request will be. I do believe the rate request is actually very, very close to the 7% we've projected, um, and I think um, when the act, when we asked, and I actually asked the hour, actually it's exactly that question um, a year and a half ago uh, of what, how do they think, what do they think uh, about our projection of seven, six and a half and six. Um, and they said, we think that that is not conservative by any means. Um, in, in, the in the type of increases we're seeing going forward, we believe that those are perfectly legitimate, reasonable increases uh, for projections and could perhaps be higher. So we now have evidence um, that the increase for the first year is going to be slightly less, and it could be, le if it's less than uh, 6.97, that's good, um, because those are additional savings that we will achieve. And we now have an agreement uh, for the future years of the, uh, of the three and a half and three. So we know for certain um, that the costs are coming in less than we projected. That's why we reached the collective bargaining agreement. Um, they wouldn't be coming in less if we hadn't reached an agreement with savings uh, that are they're now part of our understanding. And so we now know and are able to use the difference, the delta, between those projections and the numbers that we're now seeing uh, and the savings that we're projecting as a basis for, um, for our financial planning and for our uh, budgeting. Okay, thank you. The committees have previously expressed uh, our concerns about the merger of uh, GHI and HIP in 2006 uh, under Emblem Health, uh, which the city actually at that time tried to halt. When the deal was approved, were any safeguards put in place to stop Emblem Health from using their newfound market power to increase premiums? And if so, what were they? So look, we think that we have over, again, starting 2014, um, dramatically impacted um, the rate of increase uh, in the, uh, uh, the HIP and the GHI plans. That is not to say uh, that we think that that is uh, the end of the discussion, and that's why in Table 20, uh, the very first thing I mentioned um, was RFPs for replacement of CBP and HIP HMO plans. That is still needs to be discussed, uh, and I believe that competition in the market is critically important to make sure um, that the city, its workers, the unions, and the taxpayers are getting the most efficient plans that are possible um, while providing excellent health care service. 
Okay, Commissioner, in your testimony, you uh, spoke a little bit about PrEP, and uh, it's an issue of major concern to me. Uh, we have seen the lowest number of people contracting AIDS or HIV uh, in many, many years. I think it's about 6,600 or so over the last year. However, there are still those people who are unfortunately contracting AIDS. And uh, the issue of PrEP has been brought to my attention by members of GOAL, the uh, Gay Officers Action League. Um, would you be willing to walk through this uh, question with me? Who does and who does not have access to PrEP? Uh, and what is the city's plan to make every single employee access, have access to these uh, life-saving plans? I know you just did a little bit in your, in your testimony, but um, I really would like to have a little further discussion with you on that. Sure, sure. So listen, first I want to state that the administration is absolutely committed um, to, uh, uh, this, uh, to this care being available, uh, and I think the fact that 97% of the workforce has access um, is a statement of how important it is, how the, important the city believes it is, and how important the union leadership uh, believes that it is, because the plans do indeed cover this for 97% of the workers. But there are still two issues that need to be resolved. One is the 3% um, that don't, and they are in four unions, um, three that we know for sure and one that's not responded. Um, and we have sent letters, and I think you have the letters to each of those four unions um, stating that there's is a concern that they should take a hard look at that. Uh, and I believe that the council um, can apply pressure along with us that would be very helpful um, to make clear uh, how important uh, we all think this is. So that is one area, is that the pressure should be, should be enhanced, should be uh, uh, on the, uh, um, those, those three or four unions that don't provide the coverage to the uh, 11,000 uh, um, or so or 12,000 total employees that don't have coverage. The other thing is how we can get control over the costs. Um, and I do believe um, that the model we, we talked about for Hep C um, is something we need to take a look at here, and perhaps that, and that's something we will be looking at right away, um, and can be an area to reduce costs. And finally, uh, this will be front and center in the conversation I have this afternoon um, with the Municipal Labor Committee um, to talk about the need to get to 100% coverage and get the labor input um, in that as well. Okay, the mayor has committed himself to uh, ending the epidemic by 2020. Uh, and uh, we want to continue to uh, make sure that that discussion continues to happen. So we'll be in contact with you about that again. Uh, and finally, before I turn it over to um, my colleague, uh, Chair uh, Miller, um, the previous agreement came with somewhat regular progress reports, but can you commit today to produce the quarterly updates of the status of the 2018 savings program? Yes, we do commit to that. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn it over to Chair Miller. Thank you, Chair Drum, and, and thank you for that line of questioning that was so in, insightful. And, and um, while you are the finance chair, I, I think that because I am a, a former uh, benefit trustee and business agent, I think that I am just slightly uh, uh, able to ask a few questions that will continue along those lines okay. there. And, um, so I thank you for your line of questioning. I know we, that, that uh, other members certainly have a lot of questions there. Um, while I want to focus on the quality of care, I do have a few questions directly related to the finance and, and, and how, in fact, we were able uh, to finance this, this um, program that we had seen now. And I know my, my colleague asked about the, the rate increases and so forth and that there was there. My information was, was pretty consistent with my colleagues that it was more in the line of about five and a half percent and that if we were to see that and that was an achievable number, that would be pretty much uh, the savings that, that we're discussing here today. Um, but I don't want to belabor that. We'll just let the numbers speak for itself. And, and just ask that, when was the last time that OLR or OMB has, has um, written to the State Department of Financial Service uh, uh, opposing an increase from a, a benefit provider? Excuse me. In I this case, obviously, HIP. Or I can get the end of When was the last time that the uh, 
the, the OL, OL, OLR, OMB has, the, the administration has written to the state opposing an increased request? Every year we, we, we respond and every year we protest the rate. Okay. And um, the savings that the city, uh, is the savings that, that this plan that the city is achieving currently, is that unique uh, to, to the city? other municipalities, because obviously we're talking about the high increases that we've seen historically, but we know that um, over the past few years where there was some, some restrictions made through health care reform that we had not seen those traditional numbers and increases that we were seeing. Are other municipalities or even other agencies such as the MTA and, and more regionally uh, um, receiving similar results, or is this savings unique? to this program and what we're doing here? Look, I think most employers around the country are dealing with health care costs. Um, and when there's collective bargaining, almost all are dealing with health care costs in collective bargaining. Uh, that is why there is a health care crisis in the country, is that health care costs are rising way above inflation, and employers are trying to find various approaches um, to deal with that. Many employers they take move quickly to the answer of, well, there's nothing we can do about those costs. Let's have the employees pay. Um, and uh, others have said that's what the city should be doing. Um, my view is that is not right. Uh, what we should be looking at is how we bring down the trend factors um, into numbers like the three and a half and the three, uh, which should approximate uh, inflation or be a little more than inflation, but at least closer to inflation levels um, in, the, in the going out years. Um, that's where we should be going. Um, in terms of looking at others and how we compare, um, I think we compare favorably, but I would also point out if you look at the Tripartite Health Savings Committee, um, that the middle bullet um, is comparability. Um, so we will study with labor. Um, we will continue to study how our plan compares to others. We will benchmark other plans, um, and we will see how we compare. But they differ, and many of them, as we know, are not even at uh, high single digits, but many plans are increasing at uh, double digits and substantial double digit increases. So I think that we should all celebrate um, that we have uh, come up with an agreement um, and an approach that keeps our health plan inflation um, to 3.5% in 20 and 3% in 21, uh, that's an extraordinary achievement. Um, and I think we all should acknowledge it uh, and, uh, and say that that's good. How do we do better? So that wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, considering that you and I have had a lot of conversations about health care services, how they get delivered, how efficient and effectively they are, and that while we have achieved a certain goal, I think that we both can agree that, that this is not unique to the industry nor unique to labor. Some of these savings and how they've been done, the fact of the matter is that they have been done regionally, they have been done right around here in, in other areas, and, and so I'd like to divert now the attention to the quality of health care that we're receiving and whether or not this has an impact on the quality. You've put an emphasis on how we've moved from certain specialized services and kind of brought them in-house. Have we then, before making this commitment, evaluating how those services get delivered to the overall membership throughout, you know, first of all, the, the plan is a, a regional plan, and, and that has value in itself, right? That you basically can't live outside of the 18 or 30, 18 counties or whatever, and, and receive benefits, right? So for retirees, th that's, that's interesting, um, to, to say the least. But whether or not we, we, we're looking at how this specific plan design impacts those, uh, the workforce and the retired workforce. For instance, if we're driving folks towards an advantage care system, right, because costs has come down, what we've seen previously uh, was three, four hour, literally, waits in, in, in an uh, advantage care system or center. 
um, particularly in a community like Eastern Southern Queens where you have a, a uh, probably I would submit the largest number of public servants and retirees in the entire city, right? So before we design a system that is designed to benefit those who go into those advantage care systems, do we know that we have, um, uh, that we can meet the demand, right? Do, that we have those. I would submit that that is not the case. Um, how do we adjust to that and what provisions are in place so that um, more that, that we have a, a, a larger or richer network that addresses those issues? So let me uh, answer a couple of things. First, um, I do completely agree with you that we can't simply rest at what we're doing and not look at how others are providing health care um, and seeing how we can improve. And I don't by any means say um, that we are doing it uh, as well as possibly can be done. I started by saying um, that when we arrived, uh, the approach to health care um, had largely not changed um, in, uh, in decades. Um, and so we should be looking at how others provide. We should be looking at how you get to state of, art, of our art, state of the art approaches to delivery of health care systems. Um, so I, I totally agree with you that we should not be saying, this is it, um, we can't do better, and that's why I really believe, if you look at the tripartite committee commitment, um, we are looking at all those areas, and that is on top of the health care saving costs that we talked about. Um, we're looking at all of those multiple areas, which are all directed towards how we improve our plan and get to a more efficient and effective plan. Um, and also, without the, uh, um, the central theme of simply moving costs to the, um, to the workers. I do have to say, just in terms of the, uh, um, of the uh, ACPs, um, I use the one on Duane Street over here and have had pretty good results. Um, I understand what you're saying is, look, it's, it's uneven uh, and, that, uh, and that that should be monitored. And I think that is something we need, need to monitor. What are wait times? What are, uh, um, what are the, uh, what's the delivery service? Are they, are they in fact delivering um, effective care at a at a reduced price and it's one of the things i think that we are looking at and i'll give it to claire for a second yeah my understanding is that emblem health has um has been investing significantly into upgrading the their advantage care facilities um, and that they have worked very hard to bring down the wait times at facilities what we can do is request a report from them um, of the wait times at the various facilities so we can report to the council on what people are experiencing at different facilities. So I, 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 I don't want to lose track of what we're kind of talking about in terms of uh, uh, on the, the financing side, how do we, how do we pay for this? Um, but on quality care, let's, let's kind of stay there for a moment. Um, when, 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 you, when we procure with them, first of all, I have a problem with this, this, this single provider that we have there, that a single provider that, as, as you alluded to, that doesn't have the competition that I think is necessary here. And the fact that when we talk about high option riders, um, when, 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 you don't, when you aren't able to provide the same level of services throughout the city that those members, retirees, and dependents should have an option, right? This doesn't provide an option even when you have a high option. I, uh, right, my benefit prior to coming here, which is what a lot of folks in this city have, is nothing special. MTA and other agencies have it. In order for me to maintain that would cost me $1,100 a month here. Let me just ask you, does the city contribute at all to the high option riders? No. No, we do not. You just offer the plan, but you just, so it, exclusively, this is just what you offer. It, so I can go on my own and get that. I don't, I, you wouldn't be insured, uh, but you could try and seek other insurance. Uh, yes. So, no, that's what I'm saying yes. is, is that if I went out on my own, it would cost essentially the same. No, I don't, know that, I don't know that that's true. I mean, it's, it's based on, we were a large group purchasing it, but it is. Uh, Nobody's but purchasing we don't, but we don't insurance at $1,100 a month. Not when they can get something else. I just, I, I think that that is something that just came out when we kind of read between the lines that what 
where those contributions went. And, and I know during open enrollment, it's offered as part of the cafeteria plan, but there's also an assumption that there's some contribution coming from the city. And so obviously you, we're steering everybody into this particular plan if you're not able to do that. That being said, um, we, we were talking about how we provide a better service uh, through the, the Advantage Care. But analyzing the data about who's using and what those wait times are, and if not, if you aren't able to provide an equitable service, how do we open up the market to those people that live in Queens and other areas that have high density of, of, of city workers? So look, I, we have discussed this a number of times, and, and I, I always agree with you, that we need to pursue greater competition. We need to see what is out there, um, and, and I believe that we've made progress uh, in the collective bargaining with beginning to look at opening this up. We did bid out some prescription drug um, uh, op opportunities last time. We will do more. Uh, and that's why I think that the importance of this tripartite panel is so important. We are committed labor and management to look at those issues, and we have a labor agreement. Let me just go back to the labor agreement for a minute, that to the extent that we can, res we can achieve savings beyond the $600 million, we have a joint interest in doing that because there is a gain-sharing approach. There's the use of the funds um, for certain uh, for welfare fund increases. There is a joint increase to increase beyond the 600 million. So I am optimistic that we not only achieve 600 million, but we achieve more. And some of the things you're talking about are all elements that would make that so more likely. So when 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 when. I know from, from a labor perspective, the, the contracts and uh, benefits negotiated, right? How they get delivered, who deliver them is, is not part of that, right? But when the city is procuring uh, uh, benefits, in this case from Emblem Health, are there a set of standards as to how <coughs> they get provided? What are the number of doctors per patient? What is the wait time that we're expecting? Let me give you an example here, and not just of the wait times at, at those Emblem Health. You probably, I, I tried for the last week to get an appointment to see my doctor and I finally got one for January, right? But they said I can come in and I can see someone uh, today or tomorrow if, if it was an emergency situation. That person that I would be able to see would be a nurse practitioner. Three years ago when, when, my, when my previous doctor left and I wanted to see someone, I was seeing a physician's assistant. So in the past five years, through attrition or, second question, the rate of, of, of uh, reimbursement for doctors, which is probably the reason why people are leaving the system, we no longer see doctors, we are seeing physician assistants. We now no longer see physician assistants, we're seeing nurse practitioners. Is that what we're paying for? And is that, is that specifically specified in the contract that that can be done, or are we paying to see doctors? So first of all, the ability to, on our own, do an RFP for other, uh, um, for other plans is something that the last administration tried and was stopped in court. So it re does require, based on court decision, it requires um, an agreement uh, to move forward with an RFP together, and that's why we're continuing to talk about those things. Well, I but disagree. In, I just want you to move on and answer the second question. Okay, part. but in terms of the of what we're purchasing, um, look, I, I, the specifics of who is the the best provider of certain um, of of certain services, whether it is. A, uh, a, a physician, a primary care physician or a specialist, or whether it is a physician's assistant um, or a nurse practitioner, or whether anesthesia can be done through an anesthetist or a, uh, um, a certified nurse um, anesthetist. Those are all issues that are, is, is the direction of where healthcare is going. I believe that the important thing to look at are results um, and outcomes. Uh, and, uh, and we look at those things, and I believe that the, 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 the bottom line is that the outcomes continue to improve. 
um, and I don't know who the specific provider is best for any given service. It may be um, that it, it can be a nurse rather than a physician. Um, it could be that the nurse is providing better service in certain circumstances um, than a physician. But the issue to me is whether the outcomes uh, are improving or not, and those are things that we need to pay attention to. So would you say that, that so th th those are now industry practices or something specific, is it or is a specific cost savings practice that, that we're seeing here? Because I, 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 I certainly see a difference in whether or not, and certainly I think even um, anyone looking peripherally could see that there is a savings between a doctor a doctor's uh, uh, physician's assistant and a nurse practitioner. There's a obviously cost difference. Yes. But, but look, they, uh, Is it cheaper to employ a doctor or of course, a, a, of course, or, of course or the, re the reason the reason throughout the country that employers and plans consider using a nurse specialist of some sort rather than a physician is because they're less expensive. The question to me is not whether it's less expensive. The question to me is does it provide is good service or perhaps better Absolutely. service? Absolutely. Yes, and I believe that needs to be looked at. Uh, <laughs> but I but I don't you, believe you, you, but wait I, a minute. I don't believe per se that the use of a nurse as opposed to a physician for a certain service is per se less good delivery of service. I, you, you know what, I, I'd like to see the data that, that, w that would, would contradict that. I, I think on the surface, I, I just based on qualifications and, and knowing that if you look, if, if, if you're procuring, if, you, if you're attempting to leverage one million members and for healthcare, it would not concern you the amount of doctors that are in the system per, per, per capita for, for, for your members there, whether or not they could provide adequate service there? Of course. Here's what I know also. In the last five years, as I said, you had X amount of doctors. Now you may have, you may have 10 or 20 percent less. Those doctors do attrition or whatever, they just left. They have not been replaced by doctors. We're not talking about whether or not you walk in a center and say, hey, doctor's busy, see a nurse. We're saying that that doctor no longer exists. You no longer, nor does the physician assistant. Now you see a nurse practitioner. That doesn't concern you? What concerns me is that best practices are being used. It's, and and I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on what is the best practice um, and what is the level of uh, uh, of health, are you paying for a lawyer? Or are you paying for a, a, a or, or, or are you paying for a, a legal assistant? You paying for a doctor? You paying for a nurse? I'm paying for the coverage, oh, and and we're we're paying to call, we're paying for the service, and to, we're paying for the benefits. Uh, and I don't know, uh, and perhaps listen, costs differ. People staff differently. The important thing to an employer is that the outcomes uh, are at least as good. Um, and that's something that I concur with you. Uh, I, I agree. What are you looking at? I, I agree, and I submit to you that it just has not been. It has not been based on the, the, the complaints and comments that I feel daily from my constituents for, from the lack of health, adequate health care access that we have because of them being moved into a, a advantage care uh, center that does not provide adequate health care providers. That's a problem. And, and we should be taking a look at that. And before we enter into these agreements, we should know whether or not we have adequate service providers to provide services to these members. We did it in the past when there was nobody in the Bronx that was negotiated, right? When there was no, no center in, in certain locations. It was negotiated. That was a problem, and it was done. Are, are we still paying particular attention to these details that we're serving members in, in the way that we should? So, Chairman, let me just give this anecdote. Uh, I missed a flu shot when it was given at our office. I went to the uh, um, ACP on Duane Street. Uh, I'm sure a nurse practitioner was the person who gave me the flu shot. I do not feel that I received a reduced service because it was not a physician. So it depends I, on I can the get a flu shot in, in, in the drugstore. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if I think I have the flu and I want to see a doctor, I get to see a, a nurse practitioner. 
Maybe if you go to Duane, down to Duane Street or where you go on a regular basis to your, your, your PC, that's possible. But when you don't have an option that you're never going to see a doctor, that's a problem. That's uh, another problem. It should never be an option where you never see a doctor depending on Unless the you're going to wait a month and a half. So we need to look at that. And, and perhaps you want to, we should go over the specifics of, of your case and we can see whether or not we can help improve that. Could, 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 could we, so, so before we transition to the tripartite committee, because I, I certainly want to talk to you, I want to get to them. Um, and I know part of the savings was, was with the well care, uh, which was, was that an RFP itself? The welfare funds? Well care. Well care. Well care program. That's the, the diabetes, all the preventative is, is programs. It, is this, is the, this is the work well, the work well program? Yes, was yeah. the Aurora piece. Yeah, so yes. we had a problem throughout the city last year where Emblem Health ran, just randomly announced that they were closing the, the neighborhood well care centers, and they did. And I was shut down for a while until we, how we not know that? We called the admin and they opened it back up after going back and forth, but it was throughout the city. And, and so we're paying for something, as you said, a, a well care program, a wellness program that would allow community members to come in, uh, work on their diabetes, the exercise, yoga, pro, all these other things would, would that, that, that prevent illness that take place in the well care centers, they were just randomly shut down. So listen, let me just say this. We talk and deal um, with Emblem, Emblem all the time in terms of issues and problematic issues. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with what you just recommended, but, but Claire does, it was familiar that Emblem had did shut various centers down, but I think in terms of expanding others. Um, if there's specific issues that you would like us to look at, Please feel free do to they, talk, do, and you should let us know. Do, do they contact the city before they shut down these centers? No, we did. We were not made aware that they were shutting them down. We probably found out the same way you did. Yep, that was a big issue. Okay, so um, how, how often will the uh, tripod committee be meeting? I will know more this afternoon. Is this um, the first meeting? This is the first session. You put a lot of emphasis on, on, on the work that was done, leading us to believe that you've met sometime in the past. Oh, no, I don't think that's true at all. That I, I've said that part of the, we, therefore, we just reached our labor agreement yeah. um, yeah, in A month May, ago. Yeah, in six, May, and, and, and actually in, in June, late June. Mm -hmm. And that we did not meet over the summer, um, and that we are scheduled to bring together the highest level union leadership and city leadership with um, the mediator and arbitrator, Marty Scheinman. Marty um, Scheinman. Today, uh, and that we will then establish a schedule. But I, don't th I didn't say to anyone, um, the city hasn't said to anyone that this tripartite committee was meeting uh, before. No, 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 I, I just, based on your testimony, because you named a, a couple of times some of the things that you had hoped to achieve with some of the things that were discussed or will be discussed. What, yes. what are some of the things that you hope to achieve differently in this uh, agreement that we didn't see over the past? Well, first of all, when you say you didn't see, we have, as I've said, agreed to provisions that will save on a recurring basis $1.9 billion from what was projected and what actuaries recommended that we budget. In addition to that, there is a an approach, a gain-sharing approach, that invites the parties to continue working on things. So we have an incentive in the current labor agreement to continue to look how we can re reach savings in excess of 600. Some of the things that we're talking about, and I've said this before, some of the things that we're talking about have been under discussion for long periods of time without reaching an agreement by the last administration, by the administration before that, um, and, uh, uh, and that we now have the ability to, to discuss RFPs that you were talking about, um, self-insurance that uh, Claire and uh, Ken were talking about, um, Medicare Advantage, which is a program um, that could save a substantial amount of money that some other, um, as you say, other, other unions, 1199, um, uses a Medicare Advantage for, uh, uh, for senior workers. 
Um, hospital provider tiering, as you heard last week, uh, 32BJ is interested in that. We're interested in talking about that. Um, that these are all things, reduction of cost for pre-Medicare retirees uh, that have access to other coverage. These are all things that are incredibly important um, and now are going to be considered by labor and management together. That's why we are saying um, that this is an important breakthrough, but it's not the important breakthrough. The important, it is another important breakthrough. Not only have we got, achieved the 1.3 billion or 3.4 billion of the last settlement, not only have we achieved enhancing that by another 1.1 billion in cash and 600 million in rate, we have also added this approach. I think that that is truly a paradigm shift. Thank you, Chair Drum. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Miller. I want to announce that we have been joined by Council Members Lansman, Rosenthal, Levine, Maisel, and Ulrich. And uh, we have some questions from the members, so I'm going to start with uh, Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Cohen. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. And I, I have 50 pages is pretty impressive. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the work. I know this is tough, tough work you're doing. And you know, the questions reflect a desire for all of us to be in the right place in terms of health care. Um, I want to follow up just first, and I have some other questions on the PrEP issue. Mm -hmm. um, you noticed, you noted, I think it was 97% of the workforce yeah. is covered. You said there are some who aren't, but I didn't hear you say who exactly that was. So which units or unions, I guess, are not covered today with PrEP? So you have the four letters we sent in the okay. material we gave you, but are there the Detectives Endowment Association, um, local 444 sanitation officers, local 246 auto mechanics, and we did not receive an answer from LIBA, uh, the uh, Law Enforcement Employees Benevolent Association. Okay, thank you. And there is, an, there is an expectation that under the same agreement or arrangement that you have for the hepatitis C uh, coverage that you might be able to get to 100 percent? and. We're going to look at that as a model that we think could be helpful um, in getting there. But okay. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't know for no certain. No commitments. I know no commitments, but, but it's and an approach I think that was, has proved to be useful. And, the, and is there an, a, a timeline by when you might start looking at how to do we that? We will be looking at these issues right away. Okay, thank you. I know we're going to hear from some folks who, who had concerns about that. I think you've addressed yeah. many of the questions, but we'll follow up if there's other ones. Um, to date, I just wanted to just clarify, 59% of the workforce is covered through 2021? Yes. Okay. Those are, uh, and, and which ones? The UFT, uh, DC 37, and local 300. Okay, thank you. And those all include paid parental and family leave? One or the other. Uh, right. The, okay. uh, Paid family leave was part of the DC 37, the local 300. Paid parental leave was the D, was the teacher settlement. And that is, those are different because that's the arrangement they uh, they negotiated, or yes, just okay. That's what they chose to negotiate. Thank you. And are the wage increases in 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 those contracts offset entirely by the healthcare savings? No. Okay. And what's the cost beyond the savings? So we believe that the health care savings um, of $600 million um, generate slightly on about 1.4 percent uh, in, in equivalent rate savings. Let me speak in rate, because obviously it, it, it is cash and rate and labor contracts, and uh, let me go to the end of the contract. Okay. Um, we have provided um, increases of a, uh, um, a two, two and a quarter, and three over 43 months. Um, and we've provided uh, two additional quarter points, another half percent that can be used in, in negotiations for, for other items. So those together uh, provide a total um, cost of, of uh, 7.42 in terms of the three rate increases and another half a point, so let's say 7.9 percent. Of that 7.9 percent, um, the health care savings represent 1.41 percent. Okay, and then the city will take the rest and the costs through the city That's budget. That's the cost of the labor agreement. Got it. And there was some, um, I, there was some coverage today, I think the Citizens Budget Commission and others are going to be testifying uh, later today around um, whether, there's a couple of different points that they made and others made today, but one of them was uh, obviously we're, we're, we're attempting to achieve less savings this round versus what we did in the last round, and I credit you for, for the work you did to get those contracts for the most part resolved and so forth. Can you tell us just reasons why we're 
we're looking to get less savings this round? And I know some are structural things that you resolved last time that can't right. be. So, so first of all, let me make the point that after it's very substantial negotiations over health care, many, many employers don't make any further changes in the next contract or two. Uh, and we received, we did the $3.4 billion of savings, $1.3 billion recurring. Uh, many employers might have said, that's sufficient. Um, we have substantial savings. Um, the 3.4, the 1.3 billion um, was the equivalent of, instead of 1.4 percent, perhaps three, three and a half, three and a half percent, very substantial. And the union's position, many of the leadership positions, was why, why talk about more? Um, why not stop? Uh, and at that point, we would have then not done any further increases in health care savings. We would have done a labor agreement. Uh, we said because there's more to do. We haven't looked at health in all these years. There's more to do. So we said let's go beyond the 1.3 billion and let's increase it. Um, now at one point I said look, let's, let's perhaps double it. That was a conversation. Um, and the general view is first of all this is a three-year agreement, not a seven-year agreement. Um, and that, that and we've just gone through all of these savings. Therefore, it is not a reasonable approach going forward. Um, to those numbers. So we wound up settling on 600 million, um, which is about half of the number, but it's over three years versus seven years um, of the labor agreement. We believe it has led to some very important changes, and we created a gain-sharing approach to go beyond. Um, that's what we were able to achieve. Uh, I think we achieved a responsible labor settlement um, with responsible across-the-board wage increases, and we achieved also the ability to keep looking at labor cost containment, and we have a, a guaranteed commitment to get there. I think it was a perfectly responsible um, and reasonable settlement um, that was in the taxpayer's interest, the public interest, and the worker's interest. Okay, and one last question, because I, I am at my zero, but, um, and I try to be respectful of the time here. Uh, just other cost-saving measures that you are looking at or you maybe identify that aren't part of this plan, but you think could be part of future plans or future negotiations that uh, that would be would achieve savings for health care? Well, that's exactly the, the agenda for this tripartite committee, is looking at some of those things. You heard testimony, or many of you heard testimony from local 30, from 32BJ about whether hospital tiering is one of those things. Those are things, we, among others, that we're going to be looking at. Can you name, just name others by way, while we're here? So others would be self-insurance, um, possible RFPs for, uh, for the program, uh, Medicare Advantage plan for, uh, for retirees, uh, consolidated drug uh, purchasing, uh, hospital tiering, as I said, audits and coordination of benefits, uh, reduction of costs for pre-Medicare retirees. Great. Thank you. Thanks right. for your time. Okay. Thank you. We have questions now from Councilmember Cohen, followed by Rosenthal and Levine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'm sure I understood a solid two or three percent of it. So I really, <laughs> I do really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Um, I do have some questions about uh, the work of the Tripart Committee. Um, uh, partly in terms of like, what will be the if the committee comes up with you know. No pun intended, but if you come up with a cure for cancer, w what happens with that information? Okay. First of all, I'm, I'm saddened that you only understand two or three percent of I'm what trying. I <laughs> talked about. I, I will try harder next time to uh, get you up to four or five percent of, um, of the of the material. Um, to the extent that we come up with things that reduce costs, we have a joint interest in exceeding the six hundred million. So let uh, let us say. Uh, that we come up with an approach for retirees of a Medicare Advantage program, and let's say that we bid that out and that that saves whatever, $50 million a year, whatever the number is um, that it could save. If we are then able to go beyond the $600 million of savings um, that we agreed to in the labor agreement, go to $650, um, then that would be used, uh, the first $60 million can be used to increase the welfare fund contribution. So there can be further uh, payments to the welfare funds to let them but it, uh, make available. But if the committee comes, comes up, will the work of the committee be automatically implemented? I mean, what, what, what if there's not an agreement on what, what the, this concept is? We came up with a great, you think it's a great idea. Some, some yes. of the unions don't think it's a great idea. How does, what, ha what happens with that information? During the term of this agreement, uh, it, only, it, it only has to take, bilateral agreement 
Um, and there will be a report from the, from the mediator at the, at the end in 2020. But it would require bilateral agreement. We will be, by the end of that, ready for collective bargaining again. So the work of the so committee is not binding. It's, it's, it is it's not sort of binding. a think tank. Okay. Right. I have a question about self-insurance. Um, I guess it maybe in this context it probably uh, could make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I, I am always afraid, like, I don't want to subject the city to unnecessary risk, you know, trying to be concerned about, uh, but I, I, I mean, the variation, how great could it be in terms of self-insurance? It's not like, I mean, even though we self-insure in liability too, uh, and, I, and I guess maybe over time those costs do become fairly consistent, but this seems like a place where we're going to, you know, we know sort of what the costs are more or less. Uh, what do you think the applications are of that? So look, I think that it's not as if, if costs exceed projections, um, as you talked about the state rate setting, that then becomes part of the HIP pr uh, proposal for their increases the next year. So it's not as if it just disappears and the city doesn't have to pay for them. Um, I believe that with an employer with this population size that we have, um, that you know, is towards a million lives being covered by health insurance, um, that to pay administrative costs um, or to pay insurance on the coverage when we can do it internally doesn't economically make sense. And this is not just Bob Lynn uh, with his opinion. These are our actuaries, healthcare actuaries, and the, and the, uh, the conclusions of many, many employers around the country. Yeah, the only fi the final thing I would say about it is just be concerned to make sure that we're not, it's not another vehicle for debt, like that we actually pay as we go, on, if, if, if it were. A no, absolutely. I, I agree. Thank you, Chairs. All right, I, I'm going to go to a question while Councilmember Levine is. No, uh, Councilman Rosenthal. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Rosenthal. Oh. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chairs, for holding this hearing. Great to see you. See you. Um, I wanted to know about uh, people who enroll in GHI and Emblem Health and whether or not the city has a mechanism for checking number one, that people are getting reimbursement for their claims um, that they put in consistently, and two, whether or not the city is being properly charged for the claims that are put in. And the reason for both these questions is, first of all, on GHI and Emblem Health, um, I never get reimbursed and always have to send in my paperwork two or three times. Um, so there clear, appears to be a clear desire to not pay people. And secondly, um, I've heard of a number of situations where the city was overcharged for um, a health care bill um, for services that may have not been provided or for services that had been provided but at a lower cost. I'm wondering if there's some sort of audit that you do or know of in other states, like some way of comparing what um, individuals, employees are experiencing compared to what the insurance company is saying. So let me first start with um, we have, OLR has uh, health benefits uh, section. Uh, any issues like that you should bring to us. Um, and if you have uh, um, people that, and, and if you have, then. Do you want to announce publicly for the record where people should go? Oh. Could uh, you? Can I, we'll get, well, how about we'll get, we'll get you exactly the number and, and who Great. to call. But first, the first thing is we should be told. And you know me, but it'd be, it, could go, it ought to be going into health benefits and say, look, here's a problem. Because people call all the time and we help them and try to help them through the thicket of insurance on, on a number of occasions, but you should, you should let us know. Um, and if it's a welfare fund issue, it may be the union issue in terms of its prescription drug coverage. Um, and so, but, but the first important thing is, is, is to let us know and let us look at it because it's impossible for us to take action if we don't know. And let um, me just stop you right there. Do you send out a letter every year to GHI and Emblem Health uh, people who sign up for those saying that 
this is a common occurrence, you should feel free to co contact we this information. Because as a somewhat educated person, I literally have never contacted your office, and it was recently just crossing my mind to contact my own office, just because life's so busy and insurance okay. is supposed to work. So we don't specifically, but we do on our website, the OLR website, have all the information about health benefits and telephone numbers and, 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 and where to reach. Um, and I assume in when we send out the annual notices, we have telephone numbers there as well. But it, we should look at it. So I, I think in terms of, of making people aware of mm -hmm. if they have issues, who to call and where to go, it's an, a, a terrific point, and, and, and we will do that. Um, we are asking in this uh, tripartite committee that has not met yet, but is going to start meeting <laughs> this afternoon, <laughs> the issue of audits are one of the things we're going to be looking at. Um, and I will mention, if it's okay this afternoon, this conversation um, that we've had, uh, and I think it is important that we continue to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, as I've said, it's a triple aim. We want to bring down costs, but we want to make sure that populations are getting healthier. Uh, and that we're providing better service. So I agree with what you said. And the second issue about an audit about whether or not uh, GHI or Emblem Health are overcharging mm -hmm. the city for services. Well, that's what I meant when I said that we're going to be discussing in the tripartite the issue of audits of Emblem uh, this has never crossed your mind before to be thinking in my understanding yeah. was in 2014 you were starting to work on audits and maybe had done so previously so we've done a number of audits of a number of elements uh, for, and we inherited a very important audit uh, from the last administration on the audit of appropriate coverage um, we have been talking to the unions in this again we act we operate bilaterally not uh, not unilaterally um, and we have made some progress, and mainly progress, in terms of the coverage issues. Um, in terms of the service delivery, um, we're getting there. I guess um, sorry, my question may have been a little confusing, if I may, for one second, um, because I asked about two diametrically opposed examples. So set aside for ex the example about not getting reimbursed for services that one should get, reimbursement for. Separate and apart from that, it's my understanding that um, there have been cases in the past where um, the city has been overcharged by GHI for services provided. And I'm wondering if um, what the process is for communication between the insurance company, the city, who then pays the insurance company, right, for some stuff, and the individual as to whether or not the service was actually provided and what the bill was for that service and whether or not the city is being overcharged by the insurance company for services. Does that make sense, or maybe well, that? So there, there are certain, several levels of where problems could develop. Um, one is the physician is overcharging or charging sure. for services, uh, and that that filters through the, uh, through the system sure. and, we, and we get it. Um, we do regularly look at um, the costs and, 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 and seek to analyze it, but it seems to me that you're raising, uh, uh, that we should be doing more, and, that, and we've been saying that we should be doing more, and it's my hope that we move forward in audits in those areas as well. Um, but, but I do uh, believe that that is front and center, as, as, and I say front and center, it's on the list uh, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, um, of, of one of the items, audit, audits and coordination of benefits, um, are exactly an element that we're going to be talking about with the unions. So, I'm, um, and perhaps we can talk offline. We don't sure. need to beat a dead horse here. But it's my understanding in 2014, an audit was done, and there were, it was found that from 2012, 2013, there were significant overcharges, and there was a question about whether or not the city could claw back the money. So. Um, I think this work has been done. I may not be articulating yes. it. I believe the audit you're referring to was the uh, dependent uh, coverage audit, where in fact 
um, we did make very substantial changes in terms of people being covered or, or not be or shouldn't be covered, uh, who, who are being covered, who shouldn't have been covered. And I think that's the audit that I'm uh, under uh, now about. So if yeah. there's another audit, let's it have is, a conversation. And I will follow up with our yes. staff and with the chairs to give them the specific information. Thank Fine. you, I appreciate okay, that. Okay, thank you. We're happy to talk about it. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a few more questions in the chair. Um, Miller has some questions as well. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I keep skipping it. Mark Levine. Mark Levine, go ahead. <laughs> thank you so much to both the chairs. Uh, hello, Commissioner. Oh. There's been such consolidation in the hospital sector. We're down to really just a few large networks in a city that used to have dozens and dozens of independent hospitals. And you don't need a degree in economics to understand that if you restrict the uh, supply, um, that could give uh, the ability to raise prices. Yes. Prices are going up. Do you see consolidation in the industry as driving costs for the city? Yes. <laughs> and, so, uh, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I think obviously it is, it is one of the elements that everyone needs to be concerned about. Um, if there is a borough that a single, uh, uh, basically a single hospital provides, uh, that gives the ability um, to, uh, um, to increase uh, charges. Uh, those are very concerning issues, uh, and, uh, um, and, and we need to pay attention to it. That's one of the reasons why uh, I mentioned before um, that looking at one facility, um, which doesn't have a, uh, a monopoly of Manhattan, right. uh, has uh, charges much more than other facilities. Um, and what to do about that, um, that's something that we, uh, uh, again, uh, it, it needs to be front and center and other unions yeah, looking yes, at it, and, and we and will what, too. What, it, it, is, it is striking how different the pricing is from hospital to hospital. And uh, you couldn't get away with that if uh, we had transparency. And we don't. Uh, there's, there's, there's a second. It's not just transparency. Um, it's the fact that the nature of health insurance Re can reimburse in full, no matter whether you take someone where a uh, uh, where a cost is thirty five thousand dollars or twenty five thousand dollars. As long as the payment, the reimbursement is uh, is 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 in full, um, and there's also one of the institutions that's charging thirty five thousand dollars is doing a very effective advertising job yes. on the television, um, and there's no difference in in reimbursement. There will be an impact. Uh, and so that, those are very difficult health benefit issues, um, but need to be considered by all employers right. um, and, and one that we are looking at. I also wanted to ask you about um, the new Metro Plus Gold Plan, which uh, it's obviously it's, it's an entity controlled by the city hospitals, and it seems to be uh, a more affordable plan, but one which uh, patients are moving to because uh, it does seem to be a strong option. Is that, does that provide a possible way forward for a, uh, to save money for the city? Now, we believe that expansion of city employee utilization of health and hospitals yes. um, is in a, a tremendously important uh, opportunity from all sorts of directions, not just from health insurance, but from uh, providing guide to utilizers of the hospitals, very, very important. Um, I believe that in the current administration uh, of the hospital, there is a real move towards providing uh, care and uh, in a timely and effective way. Uh, and the discussions on Hep C is an example of, of uh, uh, bringing more city employees into, into the fold. So I am totally in favor of, of exploring that and expanding that, and I hope we're able to do that. And, and lastly, I wanted to ask you about the kind of innovative a facility that um, Hotel Trades Council has created. Yes. They have a dedicated uh, health care center just for their members and retirees. Yes. Um, they have a, I'm sure you've seen the state-of-the-art facility in Brooklyn. And the quality of care is world class. Yes. And it is saving 30% of the cost of health care for them. So could the city not replicate that at a larger scale for our workers? So let me say, first of all, the, the facility in, in Brooklyn is a spectacular facility, and Manhattan um, is spectacular. Um, it, is, it, is, it is an important approach in innovation. 
Uh, the comparison of costs are difficult because of different level of, of, of retiree utilization and different age of the population. So it's difficult to make exact uh, uh, comparisons. But on the other hand, um, that type of approach is, is tremendously important. One of the major unions in the city is very excited about possibly moving in that direction. Um, I hope that one of the things we can do over the next several years is explore and expand that possibility for city workers. I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you very much. All right, now finally I get to ask my question. Um, how did you come up with this Hep C um, agreement with health and hospitals? And what does that look like exactly? I'm not aware of it. So, I don't know, the, the, the how we did is we've, uh, the question was, was asked is, is there a way of using the hospital ability um, to buy expensive prescriptions? Um, is there a way of building that into our, util our, our provision of health care so that we're not, we're not providing, we're not buying Rx or the, or the, uh, um, the welfare funds are not buying on the, on the market at a very high rate, but can use uh, health and hospitals as a, as a provider. Um, you can do that if, in all, if health and hospitals are providing the medical care um, around um, the provision of the medication. And we worked with the new administration, I think, on a, uh, um, a very good uh, and creative approach to saying, yes, we will use health and hospitals as the center to provide the medical care, um, and that they will then be able to dispense the medication as part of that. And that is something that uh, we, and we reached the agreement with, um, with DC 37, along with uh, health and hospitals, um, and think that it's a very good approach, um, that if anything could be win-win, this is it. It brings down the cost of the uh, coverage, it provides more utilization of health and hospitals, um, and provides a very important uh, medication that is, that is necessary for population health. Um, so we, we think that model um, was a good one and can be used in, in, in multiple areas. Okay, so let me go also back to the PrEP uh, issue. I understand that about 97% are covered, but from what I understand also, there are variations in the amount of coverage within those agreements. Um, so work needs to be done as well, even where some type of coverage is uh, provided, but not full coverage. Am I correct? In yes, that and, and that's, a, that's why I was referring to the model of the Hep C approach, <clears throat> of perhaps a way of bringing down costs in that area as well. Okay. Um, so that was news to me. I didn't understand that completely, but all right. Um, how much money is in the health insurance premium stabi stabilization fund? Right now? Uh, let me get that. Is that, is that different from this? 1641, FY18. Pretty close. So I see that the, the current balance um, as of October 31, 18 is $1.6 billion. Okay, have any outlays been made recently from the fund? Oh yes, there's a whole series of outlays that are um, being made annually um, based on prior health agreements through the, uh, um, through the years. Can you so there are, for instance, uh, a welfare fund payment um, that is, do I have the expenses here? Um, yes, so there's at least 10 or 15 um, agreements. One of the most significant amount is the, uh, there was an agreement in 2009 um, where the agreement in 2009 uh, provided that the city would receive 112 million a year um, from the stabilization fund based on agreements reached by the, uh, um, the prior administration. But there are agreements for welfare fund payments to come out of the fund. Um, there are uh, agreements of 112 million I just talked about. There's an agreement that care management um, would be, uh, uh, would be uh, the sub paid for by the fund. Um, a hip mental health subsidy is paid for, uh, and PICA costs um, that are a small part of the PICA costs. So the, all of those elements have been agreed to in labor negotiations would annually flow out of the, uh, the fund. 
Can we get that list from you? Sure. Yeah, okay. And uh, could any of the uh, money that's in the fund be used to um, pay for PrEP? So the fund, as we now project, uh, is, uh, um, is diminishing substantially based on these commitments and based on more limited inflow um, because of a narrowing of the difference between the HIP cost and the GHI cost. Um, so that the answer will, uh, my view, is, is that in fact this fund will be, uh, uh, will be running low um, in the uh, not too distant future and then that's why that is on the uh, reduction, uh, the status of the stabilization fund is third from the bottom is for the conversation of the, of the parties. Um, I believe that the best approach on PrEP is, is what I've described before. 97% is already covered. We will do everything we can, working with the unions, working with you, to move to 100% um, and also to figure out ways to make it affordable for everybody. Okay. Uh, let's go to Chair Miller. Thank you, Chair Drum. So just on, on that note that, that we left off on, what are, what are the plans and the contingents to, to replenish the fund? as they steadily diminish? So the current labor agreement is the current labor agreement, uh, and so there are no plans under the current labor agreement to make any changes other than we've already described. Um, if GHI, if we can find further savings in GHI, um, that so the costs are lower than the HIP costs, that would add to, that would help replenish uh, the fund. Um, but those, again, I hate to keep referring to the topic, you now see why there's a full agenda uh, for the conversations of the tripartite committee. Um, the parties recognize that that is a problem probably in fiscal 21 uh, and, uh, and that we need to start looking at that and, t and seeing what, what we do. Okay, so on, on, on the tripartite uh, committee, um, what, what, what are we going to see different from the, the, the current technical advisory committee that exists? So I believe the most important thing of this tripartite committee is that um, the top leadership of the unions will participate, um, the top leadership of the city will participate, uh, and there's going to be a very effective mediator who's going to work with the parties on that. Uh, I believe that and our, and our um, the topic for, topics for consideration or is this list of innovative new approaches as opposed to the technical committee that's charged with implementing the old agreement. Um, so I believe it is that the, the new group, this group, this high level group will be looking towards the future in terms of how we deal with things like the stabilization fund and things like tiering um, and things like self-insurance, all the things we've been discussing recently in, this con in the conversation today. Um, would, would that include things such as the, uh, the responsibility of the provider, as Council Member Rosenthal mentioned, audits and so forth? Yes, would be, yes. Audits uh, are the uh, four from the bottom. I, 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 I would just, having dealt with these folks, and I, I, we did regular audits. I can't believe that there's not quarterly audits that are happening, and, and I remember literally being reimbursed millions of dollars be, be, because of that, because of being mm -hmm. over, overcharged. And, and certainly when you're looking at a, 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 a smaller size than certainly the one million members that we have here, yep. that that could potentially be a significant amount of money that the city is, is not retrieving. Um, so um, how open to uh, the council, the public, uh, when, when you have these meetings, we, we haven't, obviously you haven't decided on when the meetings, when, how frequently they be, will be held. Um, will, will they be open to the public? Will they be open to the council? Um, what access will public testimony or member testimony have uh, play? What, what kind of roles will they play in these meetings as well? So my view is this, this is collective bargaining and collective bargaining in the city is, is not open to the public but is, uh, um, is done between the parties and across the table. I think it's the most effective way to do collective bargaining. Um, that's not to say once we reach agreement, um, we don't come in and report at length like I'm doing today and have done multiple times before on, 
on health benefits. Um, I believe that we should, and, and, the, uh, and the obligation of the committee is a report in 2020, um, which is uh, um, a year and a half off. Um, it is uh, um, not, not now. Uh, and I think that, uh, that we, ought, we, ought, we will discuss in the committee how to make um, more uh, information known um, to the council if they're interested in terms of the work we're doing. But I do believe it's collective bargaining um, which is done uh, amongst the parties. Okay. Um, not exactly what I wanted to hear, but I'm sure that we'll, we'll be having this conversation and, and, and also I think that you and I have had uh, some very productive conversation on health care and, and how to provide uh, a high quality service and, and how we move forward on that. And as, as we wrap up, I um, want to talk about the provider, this, this sole provider that we have here, Emblem Health, a little bit. Uh, AM Best, uh, a credit rating agency, obviously, uh, for healthcare industry. Uh, recently upgraded Emblem Health Financial Strengths rating to a C plus margin from a, uh, and, and a rating which portrays a, a relatively negative outlook uh, for, for, for this agency <laughs> and its balance sheets and its strengths operating performance and, and, uh, it, and, and quite frankly, uh, which means it, it, it is an enterprise at risk. Um, of, of course, you knew that uh, going in, as well as um, let me add that um, the statutory contingency reserve that is required um, is it just the HMO portion or yes. it, or all providers? Yes, HMO. Right. That as as I believe as as recent as the past ninety days, they had not met that requirement. How do they continue to do business? Do you know the answer? I don't. I've, I've heard that. So I, I, we'll, we'll look into that. I don't. I haven't heard that. But let me say, say this. Um, and we've had this. And I do look forward to additional productive conversations um, that we have had, like the ones in the past. Um, the court was clear. Courts were clear that we cannot do an RFP on our own. Um, it requires agreement of the parties. Um, we have talked about RFPs with the labor unions. Um, so far, um, we've gotten the, we've achieved um, the savings agreements we have, which I think are very Im important. Um, but as you can see from the list of the tripartite committee, um, we haven't completed all of the things that we think we should be talking about. Um, and the issue of, uh, of RFPs will be uh, front and center in those conversations. Um, and so, so I, I, I concur, and I think to the extent that you can uh, yeah. also express your opinion um, mm -hmm. to the labor leaders of the city, it would be very helpful. I, yeah, the question wasn't about RFPs. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really about emblem, and I, I think that we're on the same page, but I, I, that was really um, a question that I wanted to know about the financial uh, uh, viability of a company that, let me ask you this. Is this the largest procurement agreement that the city has with any company? I would assume so. Yeah. I assume so, but I, we could check to make sure that, that that's That right. being the case, wouldn't you know whether or not they were had a C rating or whether or not they had not met their uh, statutory uh, 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 responsibilities in terms we, we of know, We know the financial issues that Emblem is facing, um, and we are keeping track of it. And it is our hope uh, that we can uh, um, continue to provide excellent service with them. Um, but it's uh, uh, obviously critical uh, that we have a. Uh, um, and again, the, what is the total cost the of this agreement? Of What's that? What is the total cost of our contract with Emblem Health? What's got to what be are we paying? The health care costs. Well, and, and that doesn't include the welfare fund. Right. Right. So it's about 90% of the numbers that you were uh, talking about. And by far the largest contract that we oh, entered yes. into. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. Because both GHI and HIP are covered by Emblem, as you, as you pointed out. Yeah. So it's certainly, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, follow up, and uh, along with the uh, chair drum, with his, uh, and the other members, there are a number of follow up questions, not just for the for, and, and hopefully some of our concerns would be uh, 
sent on to the, the new tripart committee, which, which as well as you, I'm excited about um, happening and that, that, that there is real opportunity to not just provide the level of, of, of this service that, that has been negotiated, but the high level of quality service that the men and women that serve this city that, that gives this city so, such a great value that, that they so richly deserve. And in particular, our retirees, they're struggling. Uh, healthcare matters, and, and, and they deserve uh, a high quality service, not necessarily on their backs. And I don't agree, uh, don't agree at, in, in any shape, form, or fashion that what has been done has been on the backs of the workers. I think that it has been thoughtful, um, that it, it really brought parties to the table to, bring, to, to provide thoughtful, uh, high quality um, health care. But we want to make sure we're getting what we pay for. That when we negotiate and and make these things possible, that we go to a provider that can really provide the, the highest level of service. And and we're going to uh, continue to talk about that as a council and and do whatever we can do to assist you in making sure that that happens. Well, let me thank you for those comments, and I assure you, we have the same sentiments about the the health plan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we thank you for coming in, and we're going to call up our next panel, which is going to be Jonathan Roth uh, Rosenberg from the IBO. And after that, we'll have a testimony from the public. Thank you for... Okay, thank you uh, for coming in. I want to ask council to swear you in, and then we can you can start giving testimony. Okay. Do you affirm that your testimony will be tr <coughs> will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank okay, thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you. Would you begin? Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman Drum and Chairman Miller and uh, members of the committee and staff. Uh, my name is Jonathan Rosenberg. I'm the Director of Budget Review for the New York City Independent Budget Office. Uh, along with me is my colleague Robert Callahan, also from IBO. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify before this joint committee today. IBO continues to monitor the progress of the city's and the Municipal Labor Committee's joint health care savings initiatives. Our office has appeared before this committee, or these committees, in prior years to offer our assessment of the annual progress. While we applaud the collaborative efforts, of, uh, efforts to find budgetary savings through increased efficiency and effectiveness in the city's provision of health care, it is disappointing that the vast majority of savings realized to date have come in the form of paper gains from lower than expected premium increases and other accounting maneuvers. But instead of focusing my testimony on issues that have already been thoroughly discussed, I instead wish to focus today's testimony on key provisions of the most recent joint agreement. The agreement, dated June 28, 2018, lays out a broad schedule of targets for new health savings, totaling $1.1 billion in fiscal years 2019 through 21, $200 million in 2019, 300 in 2020, and $600 million in 2021. Under the agreement, at least $600 million of this total savings must be reoccurring. These savings are intended to defray some of the cost of wage increases in the current round of collective bargaining. These savings goals, an average of $367 million per year, are less ambitious than the $850 million per year requirements of the previous agreement, although with more realistic health care cost growth projections. The initiative should result in measurable progress in controlling health insurance costs. 
a key feature of the prior agreement between the MLC and the city covering fiscal years 2015 through 2018 was a provision designating a portion of the excess savings above the agreed upon target of $3.4 billion for pensionable lump sum bonus payments to be proportionally distributed to the members of the various city unions. According to the most recent report from the Office of Labor Relations, the prior round of savings initiatives generated a surplus of $51 million over the target amount, subject to certification by the city's actuary. However, rather than providing the previously promised employee bonuses, the parties now intend to credit these surpluses savings towards the new fiscal 2019 health care savings goals of $200 million, reducing the target for new initiatives in that year to $149 million. Similarly, similarly, in the prior agreement, the allocation of recurring savings for fiscal 2018 that exceeded the target of $1.3 billion were to be subject to negotiations between the parties. According to OLR, these savings exceeded the target by $35 million pending certification. As with the aforementioned non-recurring surplus, the most recent OLR report states that the city and the MLC intend to repurpose these recurring savings to reduce their obligation to generate new health care savings in the next three fiscal years and beyond. After accounting for these surplus funds from the prior agreement, the city and the MLC are only obligated to find $114 million in new savings for fiscal 2019 and a total of $944 million through 2021. The tangible savings achieved under the prior agreement were the result of increases in premiums, changes in services provided, and efficiencies borne by the workforce from fiscal 2015 through 2018. However, using surplus funds from these prior initiatives to reduce future employee savings targets avoids making changes that would actually alter the cost of delivering health benefits to city workers and retirees. Unlike the prior agreement, the new agreement between MLC and the city does not include any provision for returning excess savings to the employees. Rather, the new agreement allows for the transfer of the first $68 million of recurring savings exceeding the $600 million target to fund a $100 per member contribution by the city to the union's welfare funds. This is in addition to two $100 per member contributions the city will make to union welfare funds at the beginning of fiscal years 2019 and 2020 using funds from the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund. Uh, speaking of the HISF, it was established in fiscal, 2000, in fiscal 1984 to provide a reserve that could be used to, and I quote, maintain the current level of health insurance benefits provided under GHI. The city's employer contribution for the cost of health care provision is equalized to the HIP premium rate with the stabilization fund intended to cover the difference should GHI rates exceed those of HIP. The HISF shields city employees from health insurance paycheck deductions in years when the relative cost of the city's major health plans, HIP and GHI, reverse. Since 2002, GHI's premiums have been lower than those of HIP, and the difference between the HIP premium rate paid by the city and the lower GHI premium has been deposited annually by the city in the HISF. The city is also required by terms of its collective bargaining agreements to make an annual contribution to the fund of $35 million. The city and organized labor must agree on any unplanned expenditures from that fund. The stabilization fund has become a steady source of reserve income for the city and has been used for both recurring and substantial one-time payments to the workforce in labor negotiations. The 2015 to 18 health savings agreement withdrew $1 billion from the fund to defray the cost of wage increases and also forgave a $148 million loan by the fund used by Mayor Bloomberg to satisfy federal mental health parity requirements. The balance of the fund at the conclusion of fiscal 2018 was $1.6 billion after $250 million, $4 million in expenditures that year. Um, and uh, I, I believe my testimony that you have provides a table which gives you the last uh, eight years balances of the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund. According to preliminary reports from the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, the family premium rate for HIP is actually lower than that of the GHI rate for fiscal 2019. This could likely result in a net reduction in the HISF balance, consistent with the fund's original role as a short-term reserve in years when the GHI rate exceeds the rate of for HIP. If this trend continues in future years, the stabilization fund surpluses may not be available as a source of health insurance savings. While the current balance in the HISF is robust, it is uncertain how long that could be sustained if the HIP rate remained lower than the GHI rate for an extended period. 
If the fund were to be depleted, the city and the unions would eventually have to face difficult decisions to either reduce employee benefits or incre increase employee contributions. Nevertheless, the 2018 agreement assumes there will be contributions from the surplus in each year of the plan. Though the targets of the de Blasio administrations and the Municipal Labor Committee's second round of health care savings initiatives are less amb ambitious than the first, IBO is hopeful that the new agreement's call for a new tripartite health insurance policy committee can make meaningful, mutually beneficial changes to the way that the city delivers health insurance to its workforce. The stated topics of discussion for the committee are largely common sense reforms with tangible financial consequences. We will continue to monitor their developments, and I thank you for your time, and I'll gladly answer any questions that you have, or try to. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, really appreciate your assessment uh, of this agreement, as, as usual, uh, great job. But in your testimony, you, you referred to it as, as, as go back, the, uh, the tripart committee, mm -hmm. as, as common sense, uh, some of the common sense measures that are being discussed there. Uh, and, and as you summarized, it made me think what, what non-common sense goal, <laughs> what would you do differently? What has been omitted from, from from the admin's testimony and, and some of the things that we've seen, what, would, what should be on the table and what should they be discussing in the tripart uh, committee? Well, I think that, um, you know, from seeing their presentation and, and the long list of things and, and, and very general kind of all-encompassing things that they put up there, um, I can't say that I had specific um, ideas that were, ex were, pat were, were exceeded their list because their list was pretty long and comprehensive. Um, one of the things I know that you, we, that was brought up um, by the council members, and I agree, is, is that the audit of the previous audits of services, and, and I think they might have mentioned that in there, but I don't think it was one of the higher up ones, mm -hmm. uh, maybe more of a focus on that, uh, not necessarily something that's different from their list, but definitely things that had been brought up by council members. Um, I would ask, I don't know if I'll give any, no, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, we, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we basically, uh, we, we as the IBO have presented some options, some budget, finan uh, budget options that uh, are related to um, the healthcare savings or, or potential healthcare savings, some of which I believe actually were presented in, uh, I think they were in your committee report, maybe not. Um, but in regards to savings for Medicare savings and other types of savings that the city could have um, that might need to be discussed. Um, and those can be found on our on IBO's website as well. They have, they will, they actually are, are being updated as we speak, but there are certain healthcare savings related things that I'm not sure that necessarily were um, on that list. So on the saving side, IBO has done a bit of research on those things. In terms of the provision of services, we haven't done quite as much, you know, because uh, we, we focus a lot more on the budget, I guess, than the provision of services, and maybe to our detriment. But uh, so I, I would say that some of the stuff that we have already, we've already, IBO has already put forward in terms of healthcare savings for Medicare, Medicaid, um, and, and those things have probably should be discussed as well. And and, and finally, does does um, the does the 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 lack of of uh, competition in providers. There's the, a the lack of competitions and providers, and in this particular case, the, the fiscal, current fiscal status of the current provider, does any of that concern you? Um, honestly, we have not done uh, a lot of um, analysis of that, so I, I wouldn't want to speak to that. Uh, only from what, you know, the, the information that I've heard today, I would say that that is something of concern, but. IBO has not done specific research on that topic, but would be glad to, you know, we'd be glad to discuss that. And if that is something you would, you know, we're here as a resource for the council as well, if that's something that we could be of more help with. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to this panel for coming in. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you for you. Your, thank uh, you. your testimony. I'd like to now call up Brian Downey, the president of the Gay Officers Action League, and uh, Ryan Marola, executive director of Gay Officers Action League.
Okay, start whenever you're ready. The little red light has to be on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Good afternoon now, uh, Chairman Drum, Chairman Miller, uh, members of the council staff. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address your committees on a matter of great concern for my membership and frankly for all city employees. The lack of coverage in some city worker health plans for HIV medicine, medicines and the preventative drug PrEP. Based upon Commissioner Lim's remarks, I also have to thank you for your work, council members, in pressing the Office of Labor Relations for the information provided in this testimony. We are encouraged by the PrEP figures, but until we see the details of the 97% figure on PrEP coverage, we believe that our prepared remarks are still incredibly relevant, and I have shortened a version of what's to be read in front of you. My name is Brian Downey, and as introduced, I am the president of the Gay Officers Action League of New York. GOAL exists to address the needs, issues, and concerns of LGBTQ criminal justice professionals in the metropolitan area. We are also the go-to group for many across the country who need help advocating in the criminal justice community on LGBTQ issues or forming their own organizations. Like I mentioned a moment ago, I come to you today because some of my members are hurting and GOAL requires your help. Some of my members lack essential coverage in their health plans for HIV medications and for PrEP. To be clear, I'm talking about a gap in healthcare coverage for the antiviral, antiretrovirals that are essential for HIV positive persons to control their viral load and live normal lives and the prophylaxis treatment that can stop the spread of HIV. Over the past two years, several of my members, in particular uniformed officers, have quietly sought help from Gaul. All were police officers whose excellence as officers were recognized through promotion to the rank of detective. Detectives are the investigative heart of the NYPD, and to achieve the rank of detective is truly a special recognition for past successes that few receive in their careers. And yet, after a coveted promotion, these officers were shocked to find that critical coverage was not afforded them in their new rank under the city's plan. Those costs were suddenly out of pocket. Make no mistake, these are five-figure costs annually, costs that rival rent payments and costs the city employees my members never expected to face. I raised this matter with my membership and sure enough, other non-uniform members and friends of our organization, current and former city employees, came to me and shared similar stories. They had no or limited coverage either. They were stuck to asking themselves, how do I afford PrEP? How do I get my antiretroviral treatment covered and or subsidized? The worst part, you may proceed. The worst part is that we now know the problem is bigger than just my members who raised this issue directly with me. In fact, today was the first time, the first time we heard the 97% figure on PrEP and still, that figure does not tell a full story on what coverage means, what are costs, what the high option rider means for costs either. So I come before you for help. Please, I know my organization knows and you now know that there are public servants whose job it is to serve the city of New York that have no coverage for life-saving drugs, for prophylaxis that might one day make HIV obsolete. Goal is asking for your support, council members, to address this issue. We need the council's help to scope this problem and to solve it. There ought to be an examination of the data made available on which groups of employees lack this coverage, and also a city-backed solution that helps its employees, whatever form that comes in, whether adding HIV medications and PrEP to the basic HIP, HMO, and Emblem Health, GHI, CBP plans, or adding them to the PICA program, or offering a program to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for city employees who can't afford coverage. The city's employees deserve that kind of commitment from the government they serve. I thank you for listening to me this morning, and I appreciate any questions you have. Thank you very much, Brian. Did uh, Mr. Marola, do you have anything? No, uh, Brian's statements conclude our prepared remarks.
Okay, um, you know, when you first brought this issue to my attention, I found it really shocking to hear and very disappointing to find out about, um, especially in light of the fact that uh, as um, members of the uh, NYPD um, who risk your lives every single day uh, for New Yorkers, uh, to then put you out there and risk your life in another way uh, by not making PrEP available uh, to officers in particular, but also to others who are affected by the lack of coverage um, is really um, very deeply concerning to me. I asked um, a number of questions today of the um, Office of Labor Relations. We had written a letter to them and we got a response. I think my office might have shared that response with your, with your organization. If not, we will share it with you. Um, and uh, we want to continue to work with you uh, on this issue. I mentioned uh, as well uh, when um, OLR was here that um, you know, um, the 97 percent figure actually is not even um, the full story, as you mentioned in your testimony as well, that um, the, the, the inadequacy of some of the coverage even within that 97 percent uh, is not sufficient. And I do recognize, as you did in your testimony as well, that the administration has made great strides in terms of reducing the number of those who are infected by HIV, uh, yet um, this issue still remains outstanding and it's something that uh, certainly I'm going to be fighting for as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming in and, and thank you for your testimony. I am I'm, I'm also appalled and, and, and I know that you've been corresponding with my office as well. Um, this is a problem um, that, as, as Council Member Drum says, that, that look, this city has value far beyond anything that we've seen in decades past and it has value because of its public servants. This city is safer, it is cleaner, the transportation is better, we are better educated because of the people that provide those critical services. We have to honor them with the fair compensation that they deserve and it has to be equitable across the board. What we can do, um, and I think based on this hearing, we, we've seen kind of where the money is, where the saving is, that they uh, institu instituted this tripod committee now, that part of that conversation and dialogue has to be is that how we ensure that these services, th these benefits are delivered equitably. You know, I, I had the privilege of serving as a president of a business and business agent uh, of a union that, that serves this city. Um, a smaller union that, that surely, uh, you know, uh, a couple of bad cases would, would put the benefit fund in jeopardy, but we figured it out. And we, have, as a city, will figure it out. And, and I assure you that the way that this council, uh, the leadership, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, uh, the health committee, the, 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 the labor committee, um, we are committed and, and we'll see it through and look forward to working with you in, in, in the future. And, and the leadership to, to making this happen. So thank you for coming out. Thank and you. in the same way that uh, this council um, advocated for a parental leave, uh, we can do that as well. Yes, well, we could do that as well in this issue. And uh, that's why it's so important. I thank you for staying uh, throughout the whole testimony and uh, we will continue to, uh, to network with you uh, until this is achieved. Thank I you. appreciate that commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairs. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, this uh, hearing is uh, adjourned at 12:55 um, p.m.